Today we're going to look at a very highly suggested video, and it builds off of some videos that we've already done. The interns? Yeah, that's what they called us. We made our first video and everything was going great. Then everything changed. You see, we had big plans for the second one. It was going to be... well, never mind what it's going to be. Things don't always work out the way they should. You see, we were looking for some sort of inspiration in the history building, but we should have known something was off. Looking back, it was obvious. <sighs> Can't find anything. What do you got? I don't know, we got something here about Clifford, but I don't know if it's the dog or what. It's probably the dog. I think this is going to work. All right, let's get it. Have you been getting a lot of deja vu lately? All the time. Remember what I said about things not always working out? Well... Why did you stop and talk to him? I don't get it. Wait, where's the chalkboard? Oh! We've looked everywhere, man. I just, I don't know where it could be. Nick, I think we just need to go back to the college. We can't go back there, man. We just can't. We have to do something else. We have to try another way. We have to, we could, maybe, maybe we could, oh, now you're going to sit down. We're, we're interns for Penn. We, we just can't go back there. We can't do this thing over and over and over again. It's just, oh. All I'm saying is the last place we saw it was at the college. That's not how this works. Well, then how does it work? Um, maybe it, uh, I, uh... Oh, what's this? I guess it's the next video idea. Today we're going to look at a very highly suggested video, and it builds off of some videos that we've already done regarding the tensor product, the tensor algebra, and using the tensor algebra to construct symmetric and exterior algebras. And here we're going to look at something called a Clifford algebra. And so this is a bit technical, so we're going to work through a couple of basic examples first after looking at the definition. Okay. So let's suppose that V is a vector space over an arbitrary field K. Later we'll say that this field K cannot have characteristic 2, but right now we're leaving it as arbitrary. In most of our examples, we'll use K to be the real numbers. Our next piece of the building block is Q, which is a map from V to K, and it's a quadratic form. Later we'll tell you what that really means, but right now I'll just say it's a quadratic form. Then the Clifford algebra of the vector space V associated with the quadratic form Q is defined as follows. So it'll be CLVQ, and so it's the tensor algebra on V modded out by the ideal generated by things of the term V tensor V minus QV1. So in other words, inside of this Clifford algebra, if you multiply a vector with itself, you get a multiple of a constant. And what multiple of a constant? This um, quadratic form evaluated at that vector. 
And so let's recall that the tensor algebra is defined to be the infinite direct sum of all of these tensor powers of V. So let's recall V tensor power two is really just V tensored with itself. V tensor power three is V tensor V tensor V, and V tensor power zero is just the ground field K. Okay, so we're gonna start off by looking at a couple, maybe two really, really simple examples. And after looking at these simple examples, what we'll do is look at some general uh, results that will allow us to kind of classify these types of things. Okay, so for my first example, let's take our ground field to be the real numbers. And our vector space V is spanned by a single vector which we will call X. So that means everything in V is a multiple of X. So it's an R multiple of X. So that means when we talk about what our quadratic form is, we need to talk about what it does to an arbitrary element from V. But like I said before, an arbitrary element of V is a scalar multiple of X. So Q evaluated at alpha X is going to be alpha squared times lambda. And this fact that it has to be a square of the constant multiple of x here has to do with this definition of q being a quadratic form. And then this lambda is just like some real number. So here, let's write that here. We've got lambda is just some fixed real number built out of the quadratic form. So in particular, if we evaluate just the basis vector x, we get the number lambda. Okay, so let's maybe recall real quick that TV in this case was in fact just the ring of polynomials. This is the only case when the tensor algebra coincides with the symmetric algebra or the ring of polynomials here. And that is because we only have a single um, dimensional vector space. And then let's also recall that here, instead of writing x tensor x, we generally use the notation x squared. And we'll in fact use that notation as well within the Clifford algebra. So now let's do a little calculation in the Clifford algebra. So let's say in Clifford algebra. So in this case, it'll be the Clifford algebra CLVQ. So let's see, we'll have x squared is equal to Q evaluated at X times one, but notice that that is equal to Lambda times one. Where here we're thinking about one as not only just the real number one, but a little bit more loose. And this is the real number one, and this is the basis for R as a vector space over itself. So essentially, any real number can be taken to be the basis vector for R except the number zero. So keeping that in mind, we can do a change of basis for our ground field to choose special values for lambda. And I won't go this through this in too many details. We did this in a previous video, but that will allow us to have the following possibilities. X squared could be equal to one, zero or negative one. And these all have special names. So if x squared is equal to negative one, then we have just reconstructed the complex numbers as a Clifford algebra over the real numbers. If we get x squared is equal to zero, we've constructed something called the dual numbers, which we did a video on as well. And then if we get x squared is equal to one, that's sometimes called the split complex numbers. And maybe we wrote that as r adjoin j in the video. And like I said, we did a video on this before, but this is just a reconstruction of those algebras in terms of this Clifford algebra. And before we move on, I should really point out that what we did here is we performed a change of basis on the ground field in order to take this x squared to be one, zero, or minus one by really 
changing the value of this lambda to be one, zero, or minus one. Okay, so anyway, there's kind of our simplest example of a Clifford algebra. Now let's maybe get rid of this and we'll look at a two-dimensional example. Okay, so let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So again, we've got our ground field, which is the real numbers, but now V is a two-dimensional vector space over R. So let's say it's spanned by X, Y. So that means everything in V is a linear combination of X and Y. In other words, it's of the form alpha X plus beta Y, where alpha and beta are in R. That means when we're defining Q, it has to be able to input an arbitrary element like that and then output a number. And because it's a quadratic form, the scalars that are the multiples of our basis vectors need to occur as a quadratic form. So in other words, with degree two. And that's what we have here. So if we've, we have Q evaluated at alpha X plus beta Y is equal to two alpha squared minus three alpha beta minus beta squared. So here we're looking at a very specific example. Although you could have more arbitrary constants here, here, and here. Okay, so now before we maybe move on a little bit, I'd like to point out that this can be written as some sort of matrix operation. In fact, what we have here is the row vector alpha beta times the matrix two minus three halves minus three halves minus one times the column vector alpha beta. So we've got our vector transposed here a symmetric matrix and then a vector here. So this is a way of defining this quadratic form in terms of a symmetric matrix. And now the word quadratic form is becoming more clear here because in fact we have two copies of the vector. So that would be like quadratic there. Okay, so let's maybe hang on to this observation for later and then do some sample calculations within this Clifford algebra. Okay, so let's write that down. So in CLVQ, what is, for instance, X times itself? So we know that X squared should be equal to Q evaluated at X times one, where one is the basis vector for R. Here, we're just gonna take that to be the number one and not worry about rescaling. We'll revisit that a little bit more later. Okay, so what should we get here? So notice that if we evaluate Q at just X, that's like having beta equal to zero and alpha equal to one. So we just get the number two. So this is equal to two. So in other words, we just have the relation X squares to two. Okay, nice. And now what about Y squared? So if we do Y squared, notice that should be Q evaluated at Y times one. But Q evaluated at Y is like, is like having alpha equal to zero and beta equal to one. That gives us a negative one. So we have negative one. So that tells us that Y squares to negative one. So Y is acting sort of like a complex number here. Now, what about x, y, and y, x? Do they commute or do they not commute? Now we'd like to look at how x, y, and y, x are related. And so maybe we'll look at the sum of x, y, and y, x. Okay, but all we have is this rule involving the quadratic form. So we need to somehow write this so it's a vector times itself. And we can do that in the following way. Notice that this is equal to x plus y squared. And then minus, let's see what we get here, x squared minus y squared. So just to make sure this works out, if we multiply this binomial out, we get x squared plus xy plus yx plus y squared. Notice we do not know commutativity, so we can't combine these into, for instance, 2xy. And that's because each of these is in fact happening in the tensor algebra before we take the quotient, and they're of the form x tensor x or x tensor y or y tensor x kind of as needed. Okay, so now we can apply our rule. So this guy right here is exactly q evaluated at x plus y minus q evaluated at x minus q evaluated at y.
Now we can just like look into the definition of our quadratic form to figure this out. So notice that Q evaluated at X plus Y. That's like having alpha equal to one and beta equal to one. That gives us something like two minus three minus one. So that's gonna be negative two and then minus QX, but that's just minus X squared. We already figured out that's two. And then minus QY, we already figured out that's negative one. So we get negative two minus two plus one. That is exactly negative three. And so that tells us that XY plus YX is in fact equal to negative three. So these three rules are what determine our Clifford algebra. So in particular, this Clifford algebra is generated by two vectors. One vector is X, one vector is Y. And when you combine X with itself, you get two. Y with itself, you get negative one. And when you sum XY with YX, you get negative three. And so although it's generated by those two vectors, kind of algebraically generated by those two vectors, it actually only has a four dimensional basis or a basis of four elements. And what are those four elements? Well, they're the number one, those will give us our constants. They're the vector X, they're the vector Y, and they are the vector X times Y. So you might say, well, why don't I need x squared? It's because I square x, I get two. I don't need y squared for a similar reason. And I don't need yx because I can write yx in terms of xy using this pink boxed equation. Okay, now that we've looked at a couple of simple examples, let's get rid of this and then maybe dive into more generalities. Now that we've looked at some basic examples, we're ready to look at a more general example. And so we'll still take the ground field to be R, but now we'll have an n-dimensional vector space. So I've still called it V, but it's spanned by these n vectors V1 up to Vn. Then furthermore, we're going to be a little bit more general about how we define our quadratic form. So Q evaluated an arbitrary vector, which is a linear combination of those VIs. It's alpha 1, V1, plus alpha 2, V2, all the way up to alpha N, Vn, will now be defined by this row vector alpha times a symmetric matrix A times a column vector with, which is made up of these alphas as well. So here I've noted that the A transpose is equal to A. That's the same thing as A being symmetric. So that appropriately defines this quadratic form where we think about this entry right here as being the V1 entry, and this is the Vn entry. So we looked at this in our two by two example, so this is just a natural generalization of that. Now we're gonna use a fact, and that fact is that since a transpose is equal to A, it is orthogonally diagonalizable. So in other words, there exists an orthogonal matrix U. And so what do I mean by orthogonal? I mean U transpose is equal to U inverse, such that, um, let's see, U transpose A U is equal to a diagonal matrix. I'll call that diagonal matrix capital lambda, and it'll have a lambda one to lambda n on the diagonals. So now let's take a new basis for this vector space with respect to this diagonalization. And that new basis I'll call X1 to Xn. So now we have V is equal to the span of X1 up to Xn. So that's our diagonalized base basis. And now we'll have Q of alpha one X one all the way up to alpha N X N is equal to, well, like I said, this has been diagonalized. So in this setup, our quadratic form is diagonalized. So we'll have something like this. Lambda one, alpha one squared plus lambda two, alpha two squared, all the way up to lambda n, alpha n squared. So something like that. Okay, so in particular, we have qxi will be lambda i. So that gives us a good piece of information here. That tells us that inside the Clifford algebra, we know how to multiply xi with xi. So we have 
xi times itself, in other words, xi squared, will be the same thing as q evaluated at xi. In this case, it is lambda i. Okay, nice. And now let's see what happens when we multiply xi with xj. So if we've got xi with xj, well, we'll do the same kind of thing that we did before, which is add that to xj xi, and then observe that that's the same thing as xi plus xj squared minus xi squared minus xj squared. But because we know how our quadratic form works, we know exactly what the quadratic form will tell us about the product of these guys with itself. So this first one right here will be lambda i plus lambda j. And then this one right here will be minus lambda i. And then this one right here will be minus lambda j. So everything will cancel out and we'll get zero. So that means these alpha I, or these xi and these xj's are anti-commutative with each other. So we get xi xj is equal to negative xj xi. So I think that's pretty interesting in itself. Okay, so just to reiterate what we have, our quadratic form has been diagonalized. So that means when we multiply a basis vector with itself, we just get a scalar lambda i, and basis vectors anti-commute with each other. So we've got xi xj is minus xj xi. That's gonna be for all i and j. Now, just as we saw in our one-dimensional case, this case right here where xi squared is equal to lambda i actually splits into three non-isomorphic cases. So if, for instance, lambda i is 2, then that's isomorphic to the case when lambda i is equal to 1. We can just do a change of basis on the resulting Clifford algebra structure. I won't go into that in too many details. It's essentially what we did in a previous video when we looked at the dual numbers, the complex numbers, and the split complex numbers. So the three different possibilities we get here are if xi squared is 1, 0, or negative 1. So keeping that in mind, we can kind of summarize what we've seen here pretty easily, and we'll do that. Now we're ready for a bit of a summary. So if A is a Clifford algebra with n generators, so that means the vector space that we're constructing it out of is n-dimensional, then A is isomorphic to CLVQ, where V is that n-dimensional vector space and Q is the quadratic form. And here I've written V as the span of vectors x1 up to xp, y1 up to yq, and z1 up to zr, where p plus q plus r is n. So that's how we're getting that n-dimensional vector space and thus those n generators for the Clifford algebra. Then what does our quadratic form look like? Well, based off of the diagonalization procedure that we saw before, we might as well start with it diagonalized. So we've got Q of this crazy linear combination gives us the sum of alpha 1 up to alpha P minus the sum of beta 1 up to beta Q. So the result here is that XI squared will be positive 1 because recall that xi squared will be q evaluated at xi, but q evaluated at xi based off of this gives us positive one. So these are kind of the even elements, if you will. I don't know if that's the right word, but these are things that square to one. And then each of the yi's square to negative one for the same sort of reason in our quadratic form and each of the zi's square to zero. And what happens when you look at other combinations? Well, you get essentially what we had before. So if u and v are from this list here, then we have uv plus vu is equal to zero. Okay, so that's our structure here. And I'd like to point one other thing out. If we have r is equal to zero. So in other words, there's nothing that squares to zero. Things only square to one or positive, negative one or positive one. Then this is a special type of Clifford algebra called the PQ Clifford algebra. And here we would have the following notation. This is, well, I've used A here. This is CL 
CL underscore PQ connected to the real numbers or really just any base field because we haven't denoted the base field here. All we actually need, which I haven't gone over that carefully, is that it doesn't have characteristic two so that it could be diagonalized. Okay, and I think if you look in the literature, these types of Clifford algebras are well studied. It seems like the ones that include these vectors that square to zero don't show up as much. These other ones that just have vectors that square to one and negative one seem like a little bit more interesting for some reason. If any of you guys know the details behind that, maybe post in the comments. And that's a good place to stop. I... I don't think we have a choice, Nick. I just don't understand how this keeps happening. I don't think I can go through with this again. It's getting, it's getting kind of cold. Yeah. It's always cold. It's pretty nice out here. Actually, it's kind of chilly. It's always cold. We don't have time for this. 